tapping fingers, cross legs, sweat on the brow, shifty eye movement. What does it all mean? Well, today you are about to find out because I just had an incredible conversation with body language expert Greg Hartley about spotting lies, finding baselines, and how to effectively read people in high stress situations. Greg has worked with the Defense Intelligence Agency, Navy SEALs, federal law enforcement, and much, much more. The man is an expert. I learned so much from him during this conversation about everything nonverbal and body language, and I know that you're gonna learn a ton as well. So go ahead, sit back, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Today, I am extremely excited to welcome Mr. Gregory Hartley to the show. His expertise as an interrogator first earned him honors with the United States Army, but more recently has drawn attention from organizations like the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Navy SEALs, federal law enforcement, national television, and much more. Greg is an accomplished author, having published 10 plus books all about body language and is the co-creator of the Body Language Tactics, an in-depth body language course for professionals that's co-hosted with Scott Rouse. And if you have ever wanted to become a body language master, then you are in for a treat as Greg has taken time out of his very busy schedule to be with us here today. So thanks for joining us, Greg. Thank you, Brandon, for having me. One thing I always tell people you left out, my favorite accomplishment, is I've been cited in Cosmopolitan six times for dating. I always think that's the funniest of all my, of all my expertise. Hey, that's a great one. <laughs> now, in, in, your own, in your own words, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. The reason I say it's a really odd accomplishment is I'm a 20-year uh, military guy. I spent 20 years in the Army, 16 of that tied up in the interrogation world. And this is before the latest things with the Rumsfeld doctrine and all of that around torture, but we primarily use body language and behavior to figure out how to get people to talk. So I spent a lot of time there. I taught resistance to interrogation. I became an interrogation trainer and then taught body language and behavior. I left that in 2000. I've been tied up with the civilian world, including Fortune 500s, doing business and change management and those kinds of things since. So I've learned a whole lot more about people when I'm not dealing with the guy who you have to interrogate to find out bad guy things. When you're dealing with everyday people, you don't use the same tactics. So I've learned a lot more about people outside than I did actually. Very nice. Now, um, how, how'd you get started in this world? What really pushed you into the body language field? Well, it was kind of an accident. I was a young soldier. I was stationed in Arlington Cemetery doing what people in Arlington Cemetery do for two years. And you get an option to go to your next job. And I had the option to go to language school. And well, the army is going to send you to language school for a reason, not so that you can just learn a language. And that happened to be, you had to choose a job and I chose interrogation. And then I went to teach resistance to interrogation. And in that resistance course where you're teaching Delta Force and Navy SEALs, uh, army rangers and special forces and guys like that, how to resist interrogation. You write the story they're supposed to protect. So you know the answers. If you know the answers and you're asking questions and people are lying and you can't pick up, body, up on body language, something's wrong with you. But over time you learn the patterns and then that started to be down the road toward body language. Very nice. I find that very interesting. It's the first time that someone's talked about resistance to interrogation and, and all of that that goes into there. If you could expand on, you know, what, what sort of, to make sure that you're not telling or exuding too much with your body language. Yeah, so a good portion of it is not just the body language when you're talking about resisting interrogation, but being able to have something inside, some strength inside that allows you to be able to stand up in a bad situation. It's, it's a life skill that many people could use today, the ability to, to bond and, and protect themselves from fight or flight or from any kind of fear affecting them, or this whole tribalism thing that affects us so much in today's society. How do I get in, inner strength to stand up to that? So body language is a piece of that, and broadcasting body language is a piece of it, but certainly there's a lot. And I think that's one of the consensus from everyone we've interviewed so far, especially when it comes to body language, is it's not just you know one eye movement or, or staring. It's, it's, the, it's the whole of, of everything that's going on, and you talk a lot about baselines. That's right. So, so for me, Brendan, the big deal is what's normal? What's normal for a person? Every person listening to this, watching this, is a two-year-old in, in a coat of hair and scars, is what I usually say. We're all that same child we were, too, and what our parents taught us is still there. They stopped us from doing some demonstrative body language and aggression and all those things that we would normally do. If we were little feral children, we would have a very different kind of body language. So this whole thing is about looking for what's normal for the person. If their parents didn't teach them well, they may slam their hand on the table. If they've gotten away with it, they will slam their hand on their table. We are this organism that learns from what people accept. And so our body language becomes normal for us. 
baseline for a CEO of a company may be demonstrative, while the secretary in, the, in another situation or admin in another situation may have a very different style of body language. An investigator is going to have many styles of body language because that's what his clients need to see. So it depends on the person and you need to find what's normal. You'll find that only really amateur people believe that doing this means something specific. They're looking for deviation. And in my many years of interrogating and interrogating Americans and foreigners, what I found was every person has some sort of routine that you can look for deviation in, whether it's cadence of speech, it's movement of hands, it's blink rate, it's movement of head, it's the way they speak, it's the word choice. All of those things come into play, everything. Now, if someone wants to be seen as more friendly or approachable during a first impression, what are some of the ways that they can go about doing that non-verbally? Well, I think the first thing is to be soft, to appear to be soft. I have a pretty good wrinkle line in my forehead from all the years of scowling and doing those kinds of things. That doesn't look very friendly, so I have to smile a little more, I have to tilt my head a little more, I have to appear to be more soft, tone my voice. If I raise my voice, I don't appear to be friendly. So it's more appearing to be soft. And age changes everything. You know, when I was 25, I didn't look nearly as friendly as I do now. Age has softened my face and those things. So you have to know where you're at in your life, what your normal demeanor is. But a very simple, cheap trick is raise your brow, just simply raise your brow. It's what we do when we recognize someone. And in fact, dogs do it when they see people they recognize. It's just one of those things that we don't know why, but humans raise our brow very quickly. A soft smile may be good. Now, I don't mean it's kind of a sick, twisted smile. But that brow automatically causes the person to rifle through their own Rolodex in their head and say, how do I know this guy? So you have a freebie. That's a freebie. You're, you're making them think like, do I recognize them somehow? They're... So it's a party trick too. When you go to a party and you know that someone doesn't recognize you, even though their words may say they recognize you, it's because they didn't raise their brow. When you walk up, you immediately recognize that. And it's what I tell people all the time. We're designed to read body language. We just try to turn it off. Now, what is your favorite part about body language in general? Is it the study or watching other people or teaching people? So for me, it, body language is part of a bigger skill. Body language is the tip of the iceberg for me because I'm really interested in motivation, why a person behaves the way they do, what they're going to do next. So it's watching that and seeing if I can figure out what's coming next or why, why they're doing it. Because when you're trying to get to the bottom of truth, body language is one element of that. There are other pieces that matter too. What's the person's motivation? Do they belong in the group they're in? Are they an outsider? Are they trying to hurt someone? Or are they trying to protect someone? I would say that people, motiv the three basic motivations for people are love, hate, and greed. And if you can pay attention to that and pay attention to their body language, you can learn a lot about a person and find out what their drivers are. I like that. Now, you mentioned it at the beginning, some of the differences between being an interrogator when you're looking for bad guys and then reading body language when you're talking in a civilian sense. If you could explain a little bit about, you know, some of those differences. Sure. As I always say, there's no such thing as normal body language in the interrogation room because you're stressed to hell. You just are. It's just the nature of both people in the room are stressed. When you get into normal everyday life, if you see that same level of stress, my job in my life being a fellow human being is to try to lower that stress level. Because if I can lower that stress level, I'm invaluable. If I can, everyone can raise your stress level. Every person in life. I, I say to people all the time, that we're designed to identify threat. It's what we do. Our fight or flight systems are very simple and very primitive. And so they can't tell the difference between a, a physical threat and a psychological threat and we ramp up the same way. The person who can bring that down with a touch of a hand or quiet words has power. And that for me is a big deal. You walk in and you see people stressed over things that really shouldn't stress them, and you ask them enough questions to bring their thinking brain back online instead of their limbic brain, which I'm sure Mark Bowden talked to you a little bit about. When we talk about limbic thought, we talk about the primitive brain. When that's working, the other brain can't, and you don't get performance out of people in a business setting if they're using their reptilian brain or their mammalian brain instead of their primate brain. I, I really like your aspect, you know, in terms of body language about how – it's only the tip of the iceberg of reading other people because there's so much to it. And people look for, you know, top, top 10 body language tips or five ways to be, be more approachable. And it's not that simple. And I love that you're, you know, giving some of those exterior details. Yeah. So the freebies, and I'll give you all the absolutes. I know there are a handful of things. The absolutes are everyone that recognizes someone, the brow rises and drops. I've used that in interrogation room where two people supposedly don't know each other and you walk them past, they have no idea and their brow rises and you're like, okay, come back in here. I want to talk to you again. So that's an absolute. There are very few of those though. And then there are baselines that are not normal for that. So I've noticed that people, for example, who are not neurotypical on the autism spectrum, a lot of times don't have high forehead involvement. 
There's another when people are asking for approval. And if you've been around children or been a child, you know this one. You raise your forehead when you're asking for approval. So you'll see a person talking. Trump does it all the time. When he's uncertain how he'll be perceived, his forehead's up as he's asking the question. And then the minute he gets affirmation, his forehead drops. So it's, those are two absolutes. Outside of that, it starts to get very iffy. Now, in terms of you know, practicing reading others' body language or, or finding those baselines, is it something that just has to be done through exposure or having an eye for it? Or how can someone hone that skill set? Well, everyone is good at this. It's just they don't give themselves permission. Look for what's abnormal. Just if you were to take a grid and I sat and in five minutes talked to you and said, when I ask you a normal question, I know the answer to, and there's no stress induced, you answer this way. Okay, I ask you 50 questions. On question 49, suddenly something changes. Either your demeanor, your illustrators, meaning your hands are waving, you're illustrating your thoughts, your adapters. I start to scratch and rub. Now I have reason to doubt what you're saying. Now, sometimes that reason might not be a lie. It might mean that you're uncomfortable with the situation. You might ask a question that's emotional for someone, and they may adapt more, they may do something. But what you're looking for is that baseline indication of a change that should cause you to want to know why. If you don't want to know why, don't bother. This is not the business for you. Why is a big deal. I like it. And then on the flip side, if you're portraying your own body language, it's important to remember what are other people seeing? Because so many people get wrapped up in reading others and they never actually pay attention to what they're portraying. Yeah, so one of the big things, that, and, and there's another, you know, this is the other problem, is that when you know a little body language, you become dangerous and you start worrying about it a lot. So people, I tell people all the time, crossing your arms really means nothing if it's your norm. However, the projection and the, the reader might perceive that as something vital. So you have to be very cautious when you're doing that that you're not paying attention or that you're not sending a message that means nothing but is perceived as something, if that makes sense to you. Exactly. And you can get your head all wrapped up around this stuff and worry too much. That's why I say relax, pay attention, set a baseline, start looking for things you notice. And if you just start with one and start paying attention, in six months you'll be surprised what you see. I like that because people knock on closed body language, but it may just be chilly outside. You know? I've got a great, great example. I worked with the RAF for years and there was an old interrogator who'd been interrogating since before I was born. And he would fold his arms all the time. And I would say, why do you fold your arms in front of a classroom? He'd drop his arms and he could scratch his knees. His arms were so long, he looked like an ape. And so he just said, look, I have stupid looking arms. I cross my arms not because I'm uncomfortable, but because I look more sophisticated with my arms crossed than hanging by my side. Look for that. People have differences, and that's what you have to look for. I really like that. Now, in your, in your interrogations or in your coaching, do you have any success stories of you know, someone that you've been helping along the way to pick up these different cues, and then they just sort of get it? Yeah, over time, you know, it, it, life is a long lesson. To, to learn this as a life skill is a long lesson. So I've had guys who just would anger people with their demeanor, and would have them stop and count a beat because they spoke so quickly that I would have them stop and count a beat and pay attention to the other person's response before they said something. And it's changed things. And, and I won't give you names, but senior executives and companies that I've worked for have come to me and said, what can I do to make sure this guy doesn't feel so threatened by me? Simply stop, give him a heartbeat or two before you go at him the second time, give him a chance to lower his stress levels. Now he doesn't perceive you as a threat, but as constructive criticism, there are differences. In it. There are differences. Now, in some various different situations, so say it's either like a first date or a negotiation or within business, how does body language change or not change depending on that situation? Well, you know, I, I always go to this, and this is my interrogation background. That humans are very simple creatures. We have a, a fight or flight response, and we've all been there. If a police officer pulls you over, you automatically start trying to think of excuses to give him, and why does he care? Just take your ticket and shut up. That's really what he expects. But we all want to sit there and accommodate. So we have this natural tendency to take everything as a threat and to ramp up when our adrenal cortex kicks in and we start losing control of our brain. And the way the brain functions is we have this high function in the front all the way back to reptilian breeding and breathing stuff in the back. And that stress turns off the thinking brain. Almost any stressful situation, whether it's a first date, whether it's a job interview, a police pullover, all those things affect you in much the same way because it's still fight or flight. Now there are nuances to each of those. But if you can understand that cycle and put something into place to control it and make yourself feel better and put your thinking brain back in control, it affects that. One woman that I worked with who was a director of operations for a company had stage fright. And I simply said to her, when you're standing in front of a crowd, curl your toes in your shoes. 
And she thought that was magical when it was over. And I said, well, what I've just done to you is really give you a trick. I tricked you into keeping your thinking brain involved as you were thinking about curling your toes. That's all that happened. You thought the toes affected you, and in fact, they did. It was your brain staying on task. That's really what she was doing. I like it because, you know, we externalize so many things and we forget that, you know, bring, bring it in, stay focused, let, let your mind turn back on and yep. everything's going to be okay. Well, and there are other things you can do to make it better. If you look at a Navy SEAL, they aren't making decisions about how to hold a gun. They're not making decisions about how to open a door. They do that in their sleep. That's all muscle memory. So all they're doing is practice, practice, practice the things that are high risk so that when they're making a decision, it's about trigger or no trigger. It's about life and death. And there's a lesson to be learned there in everyday life. If you can package a lot of things into subroutines, life gets much simpler because then you're not worrying about how, you're worrying about if, if that makes sense. Right. Now, so in your new program that you're working on with Scott Rouse, if you could give us a little bit of detail about, you know, what that conveys and how someone may be able to use that information. Oh, yeah. Now, this is focused on the civilian world, and we're taking – Scott has a neurobiology kind of a background. Scott's interested in the, bi in the biology and the brain and the why, and I'm interested in quick response – what changed and why? So we're good partners on this. He delves in a little deeper. I delve in to say, that was quick. Why did that change? And start looking. So we give you some tools for identifying body language changes and what they could mean. We also give you tools for identifying change in yourself, ways to manage situations. So the guy who takes up too much room at the table, those kinds of things, how do you do that? So there's some practical application and we do daily exercises, very short micro courses with a learnable task. Then we give you homework to go out, use it, come back and look and see how it worked for you. I like it. I mean, myself, as well as you, Scott, lots of the people that I've talked to have, they understand the importance of mastering body language or at least having a, comp a comprehension of it. But so many people just live their life on autopilot and they don't pay any bit of attention. They don't look up. Uh, so why would you say that learning this skill set is so important? Well, you, know, you just said it. You're, you're, I'm watching you as we talk and I'm watching your eyes wander around in your head. And people automatically think that means people are being deceptive. And a great example, I can ask you a question that can force your eyes to move on my own and make you break eye contact with me. That doesn't mean you're lying at all. And I'll give you that question. All, everyone paying attention to this. What's the fifth word of the Star Spangled Banner? Try to answer that. Yeah, I watched your eyes <laughs> dart slightly up into your left as you access a verbal memory and then you go down to the left and start counting. So if yeah. I can break your eye contact with words, imagine how powerful that is if I can control you. So this is about understanding your drivers, everything from Maslow's hierarchy and how you fit in the hierarchy of people you're working with to managing how you fit and how you more comfortably insulate yourself and protect yourself from threat. At the same time, projecting to people confidence and being able to help other people get to another place in their life. It really is a superpower of sorts when you get confident with it. You know, it's funny, I, I used to teach interrogation and I would show a picture of Superman and I, I had this in a slide presentation many, many years ago. And I would say, we can do this and this and this. But then the other problem with it, and this is a part you have to be careful with, and I would show a Superman emblem melting and say, the other problem is, unlike Jane Goodall, who's studying chimps or apes, we are apes too. So we're subject to the things the other person's projecting and we're part of the soup. So we, if you forget that human part, then you can lose real sight of how to use these skills effectively and, and proactively and usefully. But yes, it is a superpower. I agree with that. I like that. Now, outside of body language, what would you say are some of the top two or three skills that are really necessary to be successful in today's world? Yeah, I think number one is I talked about conquering fear and insecurity. And these skills will help you with that. But fear and insecurity, everybody has them. And everybody needs to realize that when every person looks in the mirror, there's something they don't like, whether it's physical or it's something else. Just don't obsess on it. That's number one. Get to a point you overcome your own fear and insecurity and work with your friends to get there. The other one is to make sure that you see value in other people. And I say this, I've written a book about networking. And I always say, every person has value. It's just a matter of what kind of value. I, I said to people many times, I've, I've interviewed some horrible people, but I saw value in them. And at the same time, if you can't understand their value, you might not know where you fit. So seeing value in other people and understanding how they actually fit. And then probably the final one is not taking yourself too seriously, because that's how those other two fall apart, right? If you take yourself too seriously, I'm Greg Hartley, I'm a body language guy, and then you get your feelings hurt one time because you missed something, you'll fall apart. So that's anytime you're teaching people, those skills, they all ball up into one thing. And don't have self-pity when something goes wrong. Find out why and try to fix it. Those are just a handful of skills in my opinion. I like it. Now, you did mention some of, uh, some of your books and your writing. Do you have a favorite book that you've written so far? You know, I, 
I've, I've had fun with books. So, I mean, I've written a dating book for women, which was fun. That's how I got in Cosmo so many times. I thought that was funny. Um, I wrote a book called The Most Dangerous Business Book You'll Ever Read, and it was lessons I learned from special forces guys, and from hostage negotiators, things that they wouldn't even be able to put in words. I just sat around and watched them, and they were really smart people, up from other body language people, things I've learned. And then the last one I wrote was a book called The Art of Body Talk, and that one is based on input I got from another book, from people who are reading it. So that, maybe I should say that's my favorite because I adjusted to my, to my audience. So it's been fun. But maybe the next one is my favorite. Who knows? <laughs> now, if someone was going through your, your bibliography, which one would you really recommend where someone start? Yeah, probably Liar. We have a book called How to Spot a Liar. And it's, when you write your first book, you assume it's your only book, so it's more broad. So that was, that was the approach. And then as I came back for two, three, four, five, six, then you start focusing and becoming more specialized in those books. But the first one's much more broad. So maybe it's a good start. And it's my most popular. So. Very nice. So uh, tell me a little bit about what, you know, what is the day-to-day -day like as a body language expert? Well, you know, it's no different than yours. It's just I see different things. And, and how you decide to use it for business. So I consult to people. I do some TV work. I recently haven't done as much TV work in the past year or so. But I've covered a fair number of murder trials and those kinds of things. You get opportunities you wouldn't have otherwise. But you also, even if you don't want this to be your line of work, there are lots of ways to use this in business because unless you mine salt alone, you're in the people business. Everything is people. So if you're a CEO, you need to understand people better. If you're an interviewer, you certainly need to understand people. You know, that makes a big difference. And knowing what you're looking at is everything. Right. I love that. Um, now, I know that you've got your books, but do you have any other book recommendations or favorite books that you've read? Hmm, recent, well, my favorite all-time book, and I always go to this, this started me down this path when I was young, very young, 18, is booked by, um, by Eric Hoffer, who was a longshoreman, he's called a longshoreman philosopher, called The True Believers. And it's a book about the, make, the making of mass movements. And I've been accused of channeling Eric Hoffer when I talk, because I always say that everything he wrote about, and this is in 1951, and he predicted many things, the hippies and everything else, everything he predicted has come true. And he, he just had a very keen eye for why, for why, the why more than the how or what, the why. And that, that started my intellectual curiosity to body language and following this path. Awesome. Now, I know that you're an inspiration to many who've read your books and, and watch you all over, but who would you say is an inspiration to you? You know, I would say probably people that I've known most of my life. And I know there's a guy I worked with at Sear School who was my mentor there, still kicking around, and he's a legend in the Special Forces community, a guy named Don Landrum. He had this natural ability to draw information from people without a lot of training even, just had this natural ability. And I've involved him in a TV show we did at UK4. He's been a good mentor for me over the years, really good in business. Very nice. Now, uh, this is always a fun one. If you could have a conversation with anyone, past, present, future, fact or fiction, who might that be? You know, if, if it were just a person that I probably know there was no chance I'd ever, it'd be somebody like Thomas Jefferson or some of these founding fathers who actually we all think we know what they meant. And you want to say, what, what were you thinking? What exactly did you think about this? I mean, they wrote a lot, but you also have to realize they lived in a different time when they could not be as prolific as an average Facebook writer right now. So I, I'd want to know what they were thinking when they built this and why they were so passionate about the things they were. I'm very patriotic. I mean, you don't put your life on the line for your country and others who are your allies without being patriotic. And you want to know, did some of that stuff come from patriotism, just raw patriotism, or is there something deeper for them? Because they were founding and creating this country they thought would last. So it's, it would be interesting to talk about. And there are probably dozens of others, I mean, lots of people who are thinkers. I think that would be quite the interesting conversation. If you could have a round table with the founding fathers. Uh, and no, that would be great. And, you know, they didn't agree. It's the best part of it. That's what I wish Americans could see. They didn't agree either. Hamilton and, and Jefferson were at odds all the time. So it would be interesting to have that round table with them. I agree. I don't know if I'm smart enough to have the conversation, but it would be interesting. <laughs> Just, just to be a fly in the wall there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Now, I know we mentioned your, your books, the project that you're working on with Scott Rouse, but what else is going on in the pipeline in the Greg Hartley world? You know, I think Scott and I are working on maybe a next book. The two of us have a different approach, and I think it would be good. Um, we've done some really fun stuff with Twitter around the campaigns. So it was, it was Janine, Mark, Scott, and I were covering the campaigns with Twitter, 
and the debates between Hillary and, and Trump, and it was a great opportunity. So I think we'll do more of that, maybe some body language counsel related kinds of things. Looking to the future, more, more collaboration with those folks, having a lot of fun with that. Maybe a few speaking things here and there. I don't have anything in the books right now for speaking. I'm more interested in writing and those kinds of things. And I speak as opportunities arise. Very nice. And the best way for someone to find out more about you, your work, how to get in touch with you? Yeah, the best is greghartley.com. You can find my email address there. I'm uh, on Twitter. I'm at one Greg Hartley and you can find me any of those places and I'll, I'll be posting over the next few weeks a lot more as things are unfolding around this Russia probe and those kinds of things. It gives us opportunities. Now you mentioned uh, your covering of the, the debates, the presidential debates, and I found it interesting this year more so than others. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, do you find that body language sort of comes into the media in swings and then disappears? Yeah, it has. I, I will say, however, Janine has stayed pretty close to a lot of that stuff. And Mark is out front. I, I've done a fair amount. Like in years past, I covered the Jody Arias trial. I covered, you name it, Manti Tai, all those, any kind of weird thing that came up, I got to cover forever. And then it kind of dropped off. And part of that is the news cycle and what's popular and what isn't. So you just have to, I live close to CNN. So I've done a fair amount of work with CNN and headline news and their, their station has changed. But I do think that happens. I think it's cyclic and, you know, there's a passion for it. At the time there was the show lie to me on and that was a big deal. So those opportunities come up and, and, and fall off. I, I think it would be a great part of any news program to bring on body language folks, maybe even more than one and say, what do you see? What, what do you see and why? And it's just another nuance to communication is all it really boils down to. I, and I think, I think it's an important, you know, it's not always the spin and the craziness of the media. It's the actual getting, getting more to the truth of the matter, which would, would be delightful in the news. Well, it, it's hard to teleprompt behavior, right? Once somebody is off a of teleprompter and you start getting them, I mean, that's the reason Trump was so much fun is because he didn't follow whatever they told him to say is he would get on there and do crazy things. The interesting piece is his body language is some of the hardest to read. It's just because of who he is and maybe it's age and weight and everything else, but it's, he's harder to read than some others. So, yeah. it's, and, and the handlers for Hillary did a good thing with her by getting her away from the podium and getting her away from the chained elephant move that she did in her past. So it, it was a really good element. I'm surprised that more people didn't pile on and start asking us for more opinions, but yeah, it's, it's just a cyclic thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, uh, last question. Is there anything that you wish I had asked or anything that you'd like to cover here? You know, good, good question. You, you had great questions. Um, I, I think, how do I get started? If you, everybody wants to get started that you did kind of hit, hit that question. I'd say the, the best way to get started is don't listen to one of us, listen to all of us mm -hmm. because you may have a different entry to body language than I do. Scott comes from a different place. Mark comes from a different place. Janine comes from a different place. So we're nuanced in our approach. Most of us are not academics. Most of us come from somewhere else and we study the academic to get better at what we're doing. So I, I think you could be a great guy at this because you brought a different angle to it. Every person out there has some angle that I don't have. My last book, the reason I say it's probably the best one, is I say I use a system called read, read, evaluate, analyze, and decide. And decide means I don't know what you know. Take all that specialized knowledge you have and overlay it onto the why, and you'll get a different answer. Than I do. And I think that's the only thing I'd say. Yeah, I really, it's, it's been a lot of fun learning and, and going down this rabbit hole of interviewing different body language experts, because now when I take all these different approaches into my everyday life, I just, you feel more confident. You, you understand people better. And I think that's important whether, you know, whether someone is starting today or they've been reading body language books for okay. years, just take the different perspectives. And, and go for it and start being more observant. And, and I would say, this is a business. So people are going to have their own passions around it. I really appreciate the other practitioners around me because they have different views. Everyone brings something different. If you can mix that and create a soup, you'll have a much better view than you would have from any one of us individually. And I think one of the mo more fascinating things about the body language realm, uh, like you mentioned before, is you have the academic field and then you have the tactical field and there's not a whole lot of crossover. So if you can start bridging that gap, it becomes very interesting quickly. Yeah, so for me, when I first started learning this, I'm about quick decision because I'm standing in front of my subject and trying to get him to tell me something. So I had to make decisions on the spur of the moment, very quick decisions, not analyze tape. Now I watch people who are really good at micro expressions. I would say, I don't, I don't bother with those because I don't have a tape or I could now, mm -hmm. but I never bothered with that. When I was standing face to face, it was important that I made a decision on the spur of the moment. And other people, if they're sitting and evaluating tape and they're watching this, it's a different game. So yeah, I, I'm with you. It's mix it, take advantage of everything that other people have learned and stand on their shoulders to learn more. 
I, as, as you were just talking there, I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to have to interview him again in terms of uh, just communication for that back and forth of, of yeah. making decisions in the spotlight and, you know, asking those right questions that keep another person talking, which is a whole other topic, but something that I'm sure you're a master at as well. Well, like I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg for me. The real piece, for me, body language is kind of an aside. I, I like it. Don't get me wrong. But it's kind of an aside to the rest, the rest of the story. It's the stuff. And you'll, you'll talk to Janine and she'll tell you the same thing. Investigating. You've got to keep the guy talking and feeling safe enough to talk to you or you lose him. And so there's a lot more to it when you're interrogating. The body language is an element of it. But it, it is a, interrogation, communication, elicitation. There, there are a tremendous number of skills that are well-developed in the world that people don't even know exist. It's a great feel. I this. love it. So, so next time we'll have you back and we'll go deeper onto the iceberg here. Love to do that. That'd be great. Thank you, Brandon. Fantastic. So you have given us so much wisdom, lots of tactical advice. I'm going to have a fun time writing a description for all of this. Um, <laughs> but I thank you again for taking the time out of your busy day to be here with us. Thank you, sir. Anytime. And that's a wrap. What did you think? Let us know your favorite tip that you learned in the comments below. And if you know someone who could use a little bit of information or could would like to know a bit about body language, go ahead and be a pal. Send them this link. I know that they will appreciate it. And so will we because sharing is caring. Below we've included links to Greg's website. He has a brand new course on reading micro expressions. All the details for that are below. Also links to all of his books. So if there's something that we talked about and you want to find out more about it, We've made it super simple. Check the description box below. As always, go ahead and click subscribe in one of the corners there so that you never miss a video. Every Wednesday, we've got brand new interviews with experts and influencers so that you can learn the very best tips directly from the source. And we also have open enrollment on our brand new course, Millennial Magnetism. Click the link in the description below for more details on how you can unleash your inner awesome in only 10 minutes a day. But until next time, ciao for now.